so my name's John Day. I'm a neuromuscular neurologist at Stanford, and it's my pleasure to be uh, here and to be involved in this session on maxillofacial issues uh, in congenital muscle disorders. To get into this august group of congenital muscle disorders means that you have to have weakness present at birth, and it's the presence of weakness during um, development in utero that really affects a lot of the unique features that occur in people um, with con uh, congenital muscle disorders uh, because you don't have much muscle tone and that, uh, that changes a number of things so that the mouth uh, and face are uniquely structured in, in that situation which leads to a number of changes in terms of, of chewing and swallowing and speech and voice and breathing and so it really is an important area for all all congenital muscle disorders not just you know lama 2 and nemelin which we've kind of boiled it down to for this session but it really could involve anybody not everyone with every uh, congenital muscle disorders disorder but um, it can affect all of them. So it's a really important area. And it's really important in part because during development, you have a period of time where um, you, you acquire language. You know, it's really important to be able to acquire language at the right time. And if you have difficulty speaking, um, that can interfere with your ability to uh, learn, learn language and to acquire language skills. And so we have to work around that one way or the other. Uh, but obviously it's easiest if we can do something to help people so that they can speak and chew and swallow and their voice is more normal. So, so it really puts this into context because that part of the body is such a central element for such important aspects of, of life. And so it's really a pleasure today that we have someone who knows something about this, who's going to give us a talk about, uh, you know, what goes on, what can go on, and how we can deal with it. And that's uh, Dr. Faisal uh, Qureshi uh, from Case Western. So without further ado, I'll pass this off to you. And you uh, I want to thank the organizers. I want to also thank uh, uh, Nadine Patrick and Andrea, who uh, are my patients and the families of my patients that invited me to share the journey that Andrea went through uh, over the last uh, seven to eight years with us. And as a maxillofacial surgeon, so I'll just uh, briefly go over um, our specialty. It is uh, dentistry based, but we have additional training after dental school with the medical uh, schooling as well, general surgical uh, training, as well as the specialized training in facial reconstructive surgery and facial plastic surgery. So I run the program in, at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio, which is really just about five hour drive from Ch the Chicago area. Um, I've been uh, fortunate to be involved in residency education for the last 20 years of my career. As I'm entering the third decade of practice, I've, I've been able to train uh, 15 residents per year times 20 years. So that's a lot of residents that go out in various parts of the country and the world. We have a lot of international fellows and, and research students that come to, uh, to, um, to train with us in Cleveland. And um, so it's been a really an honor to be part of the specialty and part of the education process and, and helping patients. Um, I also share private practice with my, my wife and I do a lot of the aesthetics, uh, aesthetic facial surgeries in my private office in a small town in Medina, Ohio. Uh, but between my academic and uh, practice uh, lecturing around the country and the world, um, it's been, uh, been really an honor. But I'm going to present to you this patient right here. And the star of the show really is, is Andrea. And she's right in front of us. So, <laughs> But I'm, I'm going to sort of walk around and talk. And I'd like to this to be an interactive uh, session. Uh, so if you have any questions as I'm going through some things, uh, please feel free to, uh, uh, to interrupt me. Now, I know we've got two slides here. It's always difficult to point to one slide and the opposite side. So I'll go back and forth so we're not favoring one side or the other, right? So Andrea presented like this to me and a little later on in life. Um, and I saw her first in 2012. And you can see that um, obviously she's, she's developing in, at this stage uh, both uh, facially 
Scalley, and uh, so we're going to talk about Andrea's journey to where she is today and, and um, go through that process. But, you know, I think you all know more than I do probably that Andy was one of my first patients with this kind of congenital muscle condition, and I'd never heard of nemaline myopathy. It's, you know, as common as it is, as, as you see in the literature, um, we don't see a lot of it in, in, the acad in certain academic centers. It just, you know, maybe it doesn't get there. Maybe it, it you know, the uh, families go elsewhere. Uh, but at our institution, you know, I've been in the institution for 20 years, I didn't realize how common it actually is, and we all know that it's a uh, primary skeletal muscle condition. I tend to also talk fast, so if I, again, if I speak too quickly, I don't have the, the whole afternoon, unfortunately, but uh, I'm going to rather uh, go rather quickly. Um, and as we all know that the, the condition is uh, diagnosed uh, primarily with muscle biopsies and, and the presence of what's called the nemaline rods, as you see on uh, electron microscopy. Uh, which are these black rods within the skeletal muscle. Um, and are you, see, you see by the description here that they are within the myofibrils uh, in, uh, preventing muscle contraction. Um, and again, that's, the, uh, that's how it's picked up initially. Uh, but genetically, as you all know, that it, it can occur in both autosomal dominant and recessive forms. Um, and an X-linked variant can also occur in the uh, female population as well. There's three different types, which are both can range from whoops, uh, range from the severity can, with the severe form, intermediate, and a typical congenital form. And and if you read the descriptions here, uh, basically, as you uh, if you're more in the intermediate category, um, it doesn't really. Um, develop until later on where the, where the patient's trying to develop more of a, their ambulatory function, uh, the muscle function of their extremities, but also then uh, the respiratory in independence occurs um, compared to where the severe form is right from, right from birth, um, where you see that. So obviously the, the spectrum is, is varied here, and depending on the child's condition and when it's picked up, um, we'll, we'll determine which, uh, which category or form they fall into. Clinical features, as we all know, that there's obviously muscle weakness, um, and generally it's symmetric, right? So it's both sides of the body. It's not just a unilateral, unilateral problem. Um, the eyes are spared, and so that's you know, so vision is uh, tends to be uh, intact, and um, and you'll see Andrea. Andrea is very high functioning, mentally high functioning social media capable. I mean, she texts and types me all the time. She sends me emails um, and it, with, with proper sentence structure. So the m mental capacity of, these, of this patient, at least here, is, is, is you know, at, at, at a very high level. Uh, as far as the facial characteristics go, and we see that it's a myopathic face, meaning that the, the muscles of the face are also skeletal based. Uh, the muscles that hope open the jaw or close the jaw, those are all skeletal muscles of mastication and chewing and functioning. Uh, but because of the inability to hold the structures up, we take it for granted, those that have normal muscle function around the face, that the muscle has a very flaccid tone of the face and therefore the jaw drops down. The resultant of the positioning or the open mouth position is that the, the skeleton then grows abnormally. So you have the upper jaw then grows vertically and then the lower jaw can't close because the upper jaw becomes in the way. It's almost like an obtrusive or interference pattern of skeleton. And I'll show you those by, by and, uh, Andrea's x-rays. So you have this longer facial height. Lip incompetency is really the description that the lips can't seal. Because of the lack of lip closure and sealing, you have excessive drooling, inability to handle the secretions and swallow. Those are all skeletal muscle functions that we take for granted when you're, when you're able to close your mouth and seal your lips. But there's constant drooling, incompetent lips. The palate then becomes very arched shape. And because of that, that's the, the downward growth of the skeleton of the upper jaw, which we call the maxilla. The man, you'll hear me. You'll see these two terms: maxilla and mandible. The maxilla is the upper jaw. The mandible is the lower jaw, and both need to grow in sync in order for the jaws to meet. When you have abnormal growth of one, it affects the growth of the other jaw, and then you have this resultant open bite, uh, you know, open bite deformity that exists in a lot of these patients. So this is the presenting photographs that were taken. And then this is, you know, this is a collaborative care, interdisciplinary. I was talking to another family here also from the Cleveland area. 
that patients that have these conditions are a part of a, uh, of a treatment team in the cleft and craniofacial world. And we have, you know, we have the orthodontic uh, faculties and, and uh, practitioners. You have pediatric dentistry. You've got speech therapy, audiology for hearing, um, plastic surgery for some of the soft tissue things, maxillofacial like myself. Um, and so we're all collaborating in the overall total treatment care of our patient. So these, these are the, these are the um, original uh, photographs, and you can see this is what I'm talking about in terms of the high arch palate. If you were to put a measuring device to measure how deep that, that is, this is the picture of the upper jaw, and just from the what we call the dental view, this is the lower jaw. A tremendous amount of crowding, and here's what happened. Because she was unable to close the jaw, the upper jaw just continued to grow, and then the lower jaw just couldn't meet, and hence it had a almost a hard stop of the jaw trying to close and it couldn't. It just interfered with the excessive overgrowth of the upper jaw, the, the vertical maxillary um, bony growth. And then tremendous amount of crowding because of the lack of development of the shape of the arch. So all these factors play into a role, well how are we, we gonna tackle something like this complex I do lots of jaw surgeries for patients who don't have what we call syndromes or craniofacial problems. These are everyday patients with underbites, overbites, just genetic predispositions because of family genetics, but they're not craniofacial. They don't have any other abnormalities of any other type, speech or hearing or anything else, and, and they have to go through the same process. So using our knowledge base and experience in taking care of you know, normal patients that have these kinds of procedures done all the time. Uh, we then apply that to, to Andrea's case. So her surgical history was quite complex, obviously uh, tracheotomy in 1999, G2 placement, and this is all the results of the lack of uh, skeletal function, and, 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 and so those were done ahead of time. She also had some procedures prior to me by our ear, nose, and throat team. I think it was Dr. Arnold at the time at, at Rainbow House Hospital, um, where she had, because of the excessive drooling, not beca because of unable to handle the secretions of saliva, in efforts to combat that problem, taking out the submandibular glands, which exist below the bone of the jaw, that's where it produces our saliva, our spit, to lubricate foods normally. So we had those, she had those removed, and I believe even some Botox applications to help minimize secretions, minimize the production of saliva. Um, and then some other uh, sp uh, spinal fusions, orthopedic type of, uh, of procedures as well. So just a close-up view of the, of the dental problems that she exists with. Um, and of course, this is when she's closed, and she's closed because she's only touching her back molars and this significant open bite in the front not being able to get her teeth to touch. And I'm not gonna go through all the details, but just wanted to share with you the kinds of records that we need to, in order to evaluate our patients thoroughly to come up with a proper surgical plan, not just for the immediate, but the long-term uh, long for this patient. Panoramic x-rays are dental x-rays, right? Everyone's maybe have had them here when you get your wisdom teeth taken out. But because of Andrea's condition, very difficult to get a, a proper scan. And that in itself poses challenges in, the, in a outpatient setting like at a dental office, for example. Machines can't uh, accommodate patients in this type of, you know, uh, the wheelchair that she has. Um, we had to have her, you know, taken to the hospital to get a CT scan to get proper x-ray. So various different ways to, to get the information that we need to properly plan what we need to do. This little line drawing that you see here is called a cephalometric radiograph. And essentially, um, it's done to measure the, the, the position of the jaws and where the problems lie. In a, lot, a lot of kids, normal kids, right, that have small upper jaws will have what's called a palatal expander in place by an orthodontist. And some of you may be recipients of that when you were kids yourselves. And this is the little device that the orthodontist will, would have, have your parents move the, the device and it would expand the palate. The palate has a growth plate and the growth plate exists right down the center between the front of your teeth all the way back to, uh, of the hard palate. That growth plate is open when you're a kid. When you're a child, you know, up until 13, 14, that growth plate of the upper, upper jaw is open. So the expander works well. But after a certain age, when that closes, then we have to physically cut the palate and open it 
to allow the expansion to take place. So we had to do that in Andrew's case because she had already passed that stage where the expander didn't work. And she probably had an expander before that even, I'm sure. We also added what we call orthodontic mini plates to help with positioning of teeth. And I'll show a little bit of, of that in a, in a moment. Then phase two would be later on. So this was sort of a kind of an overview where we're going to go with Andrea's case, kind of look, getting a road map of, of our plan of attack for her over the years that would happen. So then the second uh, phase then would consider, you know, putting on orthodontic appliances, maybe some more extractions, and then finally a definitive jaw surgery to reposition the jaws uh, so that everything could fit uh, uh, as well. So this is what an expander looks like, and some of you guys may have seen this, but in Andrea's case, this is what it looked like. And this expander has a limit of how much it can expand, and actually we, we needed more after we were done with Andrea's case. So with the orthodontic help, with the, the chair of orthodontics at this point um, was, was the primary orthodontic treatment provider. They, she, they, he worked with us um, in trying to, de to design this expander, but this is the number of expanders that were there used. So uh, phase two surgery then, she, she had um, our, our first procedure was this expansion surgery at, you know, in 2012, so she, at this age she was 14. Um, and the goal of this surgery really was to correct the shape or start to get the shape of her upper jaw, which was really tight and narrow because of the, because of the growth and it grew down the high arch palate. We wanted to sort of get the shape of the upper jaw um, in a more normal fashion so we could end up doing the jaw surgery eventually. So constriction upper jaw and then move some teeth a little bit uh, trying to minimize this open bite. So um, I'm gonna show some, some surgical slides. I apologize for those people who are a little squeamish but I think it's important to know the kind of things that exist. So these are just slides of, of, of the split of the upper. I don't think Andrew you've seen these either so this will be exciting for you to see. And this is the little um, little plate, the orthodontic anchorage plate, and this is an extraction that we did. So this plate was anchored to the bone with a little hook. The orthodontist would actually use that hook with a rubber band to try to pull the teeth apart or together and whatever mechanical force trying to minimize the, the open bite problem. So as we go along, that was October going into December, where you see there's some change but not a tremendous amount. I mean, we're still kind of fighting um, lots of crowding in the, in the front um, and, and the shape still is very narrow. So, you know, kind of uh, figuring out that this is really not working very well. We may need another expander, another surgery to help with that. So these are dental records and models that were just uh, uh, shown just to show that there is a process of improvement, but still uh, the expansion was the technically complete in March of 2013. We did the surgery, like I said, in, uh, in October, and uh, we're still fighting with, uh, with a lot of crowding and, and size issues as well. So this is the progress, uh, progress um, sort of photographs taken by orthodontists. Um, and if you look at the dates following along, this is now December, a whole year after. It, there is some improvement in the shape, but still very narrow, and maybe there's some, uh, you know, more crowding that needs to be addressed as we're, as we're going on. So the next surgery then was planned for January 2014, and this time we did what's called a segmental osteotomy. Now what this meant was because the, jaw, the lower jaw was kind of hitting the upper jaw early or prematurely, we needed to remove that interference and move it up and out of the way. So not moving the whole upper jaw, but just a segment of it on both sides is what we had planned to do. And so this was what's called a, a posterior maxillary uh, repositioning. So now it's not look like it's hanging down so low, it's almost in one line. And we did these little expansion plates to secure the, 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 the segment of bone in the right spot. So that was another surgery. You can see that the, the little hook on the bottom that I showed you earlier is still there. This is from the first surgery. So that's all in place, the hardware. So now we're getting a little bit more expansion. That has seemed to help quite a bit. The orthodontist has continued to work. This is now in 2015, December. So now almost, almost two years, almost three years now since we first saw Andrea. Now we're getting some more shape of the upper jaw to be more normalized. You see the palate starting to open up. You still see the hyperdivergent or the two, um, uh, two planes of occlusion. The upper jaw is still going upward, but it's a lot more level than what she was, what she had just started with. So. Definitely huge improvements. Now the open bite still exists, and of course, 
she's closed right here at maximum closure, but because she's hitting the, the back molar teeth, she can't fully close her mouth. Again, more progress records of how the orthodontist continues to work. And again, we don't do anything in this stage in terms of surgery other than just routine checkups, see, see how she's doing, because we're now getting ready for the definitive operation, um, which we'll go through. And again, more progress records, and now we're seeing this is January of 18, so we're really getting close to uh, when we're going to treat her. So just, uh, again, summary of where we started with for in terms of her occlusion, how narrow she was, a palatal expander in place to widen, got some overlapping teeth, but expander is completed. Those are stone casts uh, with the expander off now. Now you kind of see a nice shape starting to form, almost like this nice horseshoe shape we all want to try to achieve. Teeth are coming together nicely. The, whoops, up in there. There we go. Teeth are coming together nicely. Again, a beautiful shape of the arch and really getting ready for our next phase of treatment. And again, that's the, the lower arch as well, showing you the change. So that's, that's, that's really what we're, we're, our goals are in terms of getting her prepared for the definitive surgery. So now she presents back, orthodontist said, you know, we're ready to go, let's do our assessment. So now we take, we have Andrea come back, we take all these measurements, and I'm not gonna again bore you with the, the, the millimeters of change, but now we're taking her, her jaw position, her upper lip position, her total um, length of her face, and we're gonna take all that information and then tra translate that into movements that we're gonna simulate on a computer, uh, computer software to allow us to get the best result for her. And that's from her profile view at maximum closed mouth position. And you can see the amount of lip separation, what we call inability to, to close the lip, the lip incompetence. Profile views are taken as well. So we're looking at all different angles uh, for our, our total complete assessment of Andrea's case. We take it from the top as well. We, we can see that the, the midline is obviously altered and it's not normal. There's flattening on one side compared to the other side. So we look at three-dimensional movements that we're going to need. It's not just up and down and forward and the back. It's 3D assessment of our patients. And that's the final, uh, how, final bite that, that the orthodontist leaves us with to be able to put the two pieces together like a puzzle. These are the uh, CT scans that we take. This is, you know, again, because the, of the machine and, and, and really the, the length of Andrea's face, which you could not be in a traditional uh, dental machine to capture this kind of image. So we, she had to get a CT scan done at, at, at a hospital CT to be able to capture all the image that we needed for her preparation. Again, those lines and drawings that you saw earlier, we do the same thing now, and now we're planning where does the jaw need to be placed and how does the jaw need to move and in which positions to be able to get the teeth to match, get the lips to close, and then will we'll that, and then the big unanswered question, and Andrew's mom is here, was will she be able to keep her jaw closed if the bone is now in the right spot? And that was a unknown. And you can see Andrew is closing your mouth beautifully now, right? So the answer is, Yes, we, once the skeleton's in repositioned, uh, we, she does have some muscle function of her, of her face, but we didn't know this. If you look in the literature, not a lot has been written in our specialty of maxillofacial surgery about treatment of patients with these severe skeletal uh, disorders. So one paper came out of Mayo, just a case series um, of their experience, and this is very recent, 2015, so not a lot has been, uh, and they only had six patients in their, in their pool of, from 1992 to 2007, that was the, the time frame that they were looked at. Um, so you can see this is not a common condition that people actually go for surgery. And why, we, we don't know why, I mean, pe people need it. Maybe it was something that was never explained to them, that it was, certainly was an option. Um, but nonetheless, we do know that, that uh, it's not very common uh, to have surgery like that. Um, and you know, Mayo being a you know, big institution as well, uh, they had a very uh, small number of cases, and they only had one patient with nemaline myopathy, um, and the other ones were other congenital myopathies listed in here, muscular dystrophy, myotonic dystrophies, but nobody with only one patient with nemaline myopathy. So we have the other patient, I guess, you know, in, in our institution. 
So we come up with our problem list of the upper jaw problems, the missing teeth issues, dental issues, skeletal issues. And so we create this, like, this, this list of what we wanted to create to help, to help treat our, our patient and how are we going to move the jaw. Um, transverse, what does that mean? The transverse discrepancy is the size of the upper jaw as it relates to the lower jaw. So because of her expansion procedures, a couple of expansion surgeries that she had, now the upper jaw uh, actually has really good width relationship compared to the lower jaw because the lower jaw in normal jaw function, the lower jaw comes up and into the upper jaw. We're not like alligators. The upper jaw doesn't come down, right? It's the lower jaw that moves, and the lower jaw telescopes into the upper jaw. So in, in her case, we need to make sure that the upper jaw was wide enough to be able to support lower jaw function if, if we could do that. Some of the soft tissue issues, again, poor muscle tone is that we didn't know how much muscle tone she would actually end up having. Um, would she need some sort of a apparatus or device to keep the lower jaw closed um, throughout after the healing was completed? So these are the unanswered questions uh, we, didn't, we didn't know until we did the procedure. Other things, she's got some nasal tip deviation and so forth. So now we've, we've done, again, some more tracings. This is two-dimensional, right? So you only see it from one position. But we take this information and we try to create a surgical plan um, and these are again numbers of what we're going to show you. I'm going to show it to you, to you in visual. Um, but uh, we actually have to perform cuts in the bone to be able to move the bone harmoniously and fit together. And we had to be a little creative because of the shape of her bone was not considered normal. So we. So this is a the uh, a software that's three-dimensional, and I, I mean, this is a static picture, but you just imagine I can actually turn this around on my screen and look at it from 360 and 180 and, 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 and sort of tumble it as well so you can look at all these uh, different views. But this is an inverted L osteotomy. She had a very short uh, jaw height from the back of the jaw. So the, someone asked me about TMJ. You know, we, we didn't really know about uh, Andrea's TMJ function, uh, suffice it to say that once the surgery was done, she did have normal TMJ uh, range of motion and cartilage tissue in that area. The upper jaw, you can see how much excessive it was in the vertical plane, and you have the, we, we can actually measure the amount of bone that had to be removed to be able to bring the upper jaw in the right spot. So it, all that's pre-measured. And then the lower jaw's got to fit with it somehow, so how are we going to get to do that? So on the computer scheme, we're able to actually take the lower jaw independently, fit it with the upper jaw, see how it fits, and then see where the blue areas, which is the uh, areas of the jaw that aren't going to move, it's just the gray area that's going to move, how is the gap, how is that gap going to fill in? And so this little, what we call L, or inverted L, upside down L-shaped design, showed us that there would be a big gap uh, but we need to be able to uh, place some proper hardware to allow the bone to fit and then heal in that appropriate spot uh, when it's done healing. But look at the, the bite now was planned for all the teeth to meet um, harmoniously after the movements were done. So these are just some close-ups of some structures, again, some measurements, and you can see a before and after rendition of what we were trying to expect to accomplish with Andrea's case. And, you know, again, more normal profile, nose, lip, and chin, balance and aesthetics, um, but also function with the teeth coming together. We did custom plates for Andrea because of the way the jaw shape was. We needed enforcement. And so these are heavy reconstructive plates that were created specifically for her. And now you can have these custom made. For patients that don't need that, there, there are stock plates that you can use and just we can bend them for each individual patient. But in her case, we did need some custom plate um, uh, devices that would fit specifically for Andrea's case. So I just wanted to, oh, I can't. Can you play that uh, from over there? Thank you. Right there, yep. So this is just a video clip of the, of the company that we use uh, to show you how things are going to be moving in surgery. So the upper jaw is moved up, the lower jaw comes forward, you see the gap, and that's sort of the, the, the whole movement that's taking place in a little video schematic to move it up and out of the way. Again, three-dimensional planning is what we do for all our cases now, not just in Andrew's case, but we had used our experience with 
taking care of patients with. So you'll notice also the chin just moved forward just now, right? What we didn't know is will Andrea's structure allow the, the jaw to freely move? Well, what's outside the jaw is muscle, skin, muscle underneath the neck. Those are all attached in every patient. And so what I didn't know is will, will I be able to bring that lower jaw as far forward as possible? Is it even conceivable Can or is there a lot of restriction in the overlying skin? So that was again another unknown until we get to the operating room because we have no way of knowing if, if, if it's really fibrosed, fibrotic, scarred down because of lack of movement over the, over the last 20 years or so. So this is right the day before we're going into the operating room. Remember this picture, guys? You guys remember that? You know, and we're giving her a thumbs up, and she was so excited. In fact, she emailed me the night before saying, if you want all your students in your class to come and watch this, I give them total permission to be there. I mean, what a wonderful patient to allow others to learn from her journey and her experience, right? So this is now intraoperative photographs. We use these little guides and, and measurements, so everything is all done ahead of time. And again, I just wanted to show how much bone we were going to be removing, almost about a centimeter. There's two black lines, and these are little cutting guides that give us the accuracy. This is the movements, um, plastic splints in place. Hardware fixation placed, so the upper jaw was completed first. And again, these, these were plates and screws that were fashioned for Andrea's case. And then the lower jaw had to be done from an outside approach. So unfortunately, because the limitation of getting inside the mouth, usually jaw surgery can all be done from inside the mouth. But in her case, we did have to do what's called an outside approach. So she has small little incisions. And actually, I didn't even notice them today. They looked actually pretty darn good. So we can cosmetically close them really nicely. And uh, usually, they heal uneventfully without any scarring. But we had to go from an outside approach to be able to accomplish the kind of movements that we had planned for. Again, that's the simulation on the, the right side, the, the gray and blue, but the other side, the other picture is the intraoperative exact picture of what we're seeing, how it matched up to identical to what we had planned for. So that gives us great confidence that we're doing what we had planned for, what, what's correct. So things were highly accurate. Again, the, the plate that was fashioned ahead of time looks exactly like the plate that we had that was custom made for Andrea's case and fit just like a glove. So no, uh, no issues there, and we did the same thing on the right side as well. So a uh, lot of, lot of uh, intraoperative cues and clues to let us know that we were able to accomplish it. The last treatment that we did in that surgery was to bring the jaw forward. We had to actually make a little cut underneath Andrea's chin to r release some of the muscles that are inherently attached to the bone. So our jaw can open and close, but they're attached underneath also to the hyoid bone, so we have to detach some of these uh, st structures to be able to bring her straight forward. And that's right on the table uh, when we completed uh, her case to, to show that it had lined up exactly as the overlay that I just showed you on our plan that was done you know, a month prior to surgery. So before and after x-rays that show complete closure and more, sh normal shape of the bone of the face, more harmonious, looks like a patient that we always see from what she started with. And they're just the lateral views of all the hardware. And this is immediately, you know, the next day which we're taking down to CAT scan to get that done. This other views. And she, I mean, it looks like a very harmonious uh, balance of facial form and function. So in a nutshell, looking from the dental world, what she went went through with the upper jaw, the lower jaw, and now the bite is just a tremendous um, accomplishment for our, our team and for Andrea. Before and after, right? So, so this is Andrea before. This is what she opened and closed. This is all she could do. That was it. She could not close any further than that, could not seal her lips, couldn't do any of that. And that's her right after. Now obviously this is about maybe three weeks after surgery with very little opening and closing, but if you see her now, she can open and close very uh, widely. And she's been undergoing physical therapy, 
speech therapy. Um, mom just said she drank a whole liter of, of water, which you could never do, and, and be able to swallow that and hold it within her mouth, the, the things that we take for granted in life. And because of Andrea's uh, social media savvy, you know, she wrote this, and I just kind of stole it from her Facebook page, was, you know, thank you so much for all my orthodontics, um, for my oral surgeon, Dr. Kreshi, that made this dream possible. I can't wait to see where this journey leads, leads for me in the future, even though it's over. Can't wait for the future holds for me with my new jaw. And, um, you know, Andrea's been very forthcoming. We actually published her experience in our National Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery Journal to share with our, my colleagues of the kinds of things that, uh, that we can do for patients. Um, this was her own Facebook page, Andrea's Miracle Jaw Surgery. That's what she titled her Facebook page. And I thank them for allowing me to be part of, of their lives and uh, you know, going forward, I can't wait to see what, what goes on. So thank you, this is the story I wanted to share. First of all, thank you so much. That was so interesting and amazing. And thank you guys too for suggesting Dr. Koreshi and um, it's gonna help so many people to know this information. Um, it was very interesting for me to hear you say that when the jaw opens that the mouth, the upper jaw grows down and that it was actually larger at the top. Is that true down below here with the chin as well? Does the chin grow down as part of gravity or no? Not necessarily. Um, I mean, the, the, the chin is independent of its, it's just part of the lower jaw structure. But what happens is because the upper jaw uh, grows downward, the lower jaw can't come up. So the lower jaw actually grows more vertically. The chin itself is independent. I mean, I'll have patients who have open mouth problems, open bite problems, and they'll have a very small chin. And so then we have to actually do chin surgery to bring that out to, to balance out the overall profile aesthetics. But it's not, it's not dependent upon the upper jaw growing down. And I have one more question, if I can, because a couple of doctors have told me we might need something similar to this. Um, have you had an experience with people who wear nighttime ventilation and in terms of pushing the upper, because with my daughter, it's more her upper jaw is really far back. So nighttime ventilation would be like a CPAP machine yeah. or something like that, yeah. right? So yeah. with that kind of device, and, and I treat a lot of sleep apnea patients, uh, adults, um, where the CPAP machine puts a lot of pressure in the seal and, uh, and post, that does affect them during development of that. So if they're using it early on in life, that is definitely going to... And that's what our kids are doing. They're using it during their development. Yeah. Right. And it does affect the, the job position and growth, for sure. And in fact, it would actually create a more retreated or backward job position because of the, the ongoing pressure. And it might need a slightly different surgical approach, like a cutting of the upper jaw and pulling forward. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I actually... Okay. Well, okay. Hi, um, Hi, I'm Lisa, my daughter is Rachel, and her friend Jessica, so I have a couple of questions. So this was a huge surgery, and she looks amazing, so kudos to you, yeah. Because I've seen her before, I've seen her before, so she looks really good. And we, we inquired about it when my daughter was growing up, and I left the decision up to her, because as a parent, I couldn't do that for her. And we were, but the interesting thing is that when she was a baby, they told us, that she's gonna, she has this high arched palate and it's gonna create all these problems. So it's interesting to see that as you're growing, it created even more, the more problems. I don't know if I'm making myself clear on that, but as the baby, we knew that the high arched palate was an issue. I don't know if there's anything to do when they're a baby because the sucking and swallowing was so difficult. So we couldn't feed her normally. It took us forever to give her like the two ounce volume feed, you know, and let's not talk about breastfeeding, so. Yeah. Um, Anyway, really asking for Jessica because she inquired um, at, at home at, at her doctor's and she wanted to know whether if there's any regression if you should do this all the surgery. 
So is there any regression? Uh, there are certain cases we will do surgery earlier uh, than, the, so we typically like to wait when growth is complete. For, for all patients, a lot of craniofacial patients, like my cleft lip and palate pa patients, unless there is a, function, a real functional problem that we have to intervene sooner, we may have to do a second operation then. So we're trying to avoid multiple operations if we can. Um, the high arch palate issue, we didn't, we didn't change the palate arch in, in Andrea's case. She still has the high arch palate. What looks different now is that with the orthodontic help, her, palate is, her jaw is wider on top, so the arch, the high arch palate isn't that much of an issue unless there's clefting of the palate as well. So if there's a cleft in there, that, you know, obviously cleft surgery would need to be done, cleft palate surgery would need to be done to close that. But the arch itself is not going to change shape. We can't bring that arch down. That's almost impossible to do. Okay, so now that you did this surgery, with, with the low muscle tone, is there going to be regression? No, because every, the, the, the bone is moved, and the, the, muscles, the muscle that affects the face is, in, is low tone to begin with, mm -hmm. so that's what causes the, the jaw to, to, to become narrow. Now that the jaw is widened and everything is stabilized with bone plates, I mean, those plates are solid and things aren't going to move. So there's very so I, little to no regression, and Andrea's now over a year out. Okay. I stepped out for a few times, but so the whole process took a year? From start to finish with Andrea? No, whole no. process took seven years. Seven years, okay. No. But we got Andrea when she was younger. So it was multiple surgeries. Multiple so surgeries. That's also there was like three, something four surgeries. that we have to consider because going on to anesthesia and stuff. For anesthesia is very kids. safe, but yes, for from the anesthetic standpoint, uh, and our pulmonologist can help us here, that I'm sure there's an inherent risk with anesthesia. They're on a ventilator in anesthesia. Those surgeries can be longer ones. This was about a six, seven hour surgery. If I could just ask Andrea to stand up, <laughs> not stand up for mom, to stand up, and like uh, to hear from like, the mom, like how you got through this, because, Maybe come on, you. stand up, stand up, mom. <laughs> you can face me, Tom, you can answer. Uh, it was really nerve-wracking. <laughs> I was really nervous, but it wasn't my decision, it was Andrea's decision. Um, it's not... I mean, yes, she is my child, and I don't, I don't want nothing to happen to her. I didn't, I was nervous, but this is her, this is what she had to go through every day. So it was her decision, and this is what she wanted, and it, it turned out <laughs> great. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, Andrew, you want to say something, anything? How did you manage the pain? How did you manage the pain? <laughs> it was. She was in pain a lot, but when you know what you what she wanted, she was going to go. She was like, I don't care how much pain I was going to be in. You know, she but. at her at her post-operative visits with us, and we had lots of visits. She never complained of pain. She didn't complain. Never. I mean, I have patients that complain of pain, like for small things. In fact, this was she just this was got huge hip, operation. She just got her hip out. Of people that knows her. <laughs> She said that pain it was worse than her jaw. So, what you you know it depends on what you you know what you really really want, and this is what she wanted. So. All right. Right? Yeah, and she said she would do it all over again too. Yeah. Here we've got another one back here. Hi. Um, I have a four-year-old daughter with uh, anemoline myopathy. Um, I was wondering, is there any contraindication to like the Botox and the submandibular gland removal? Because we've been told for her that the doctors don't want to do it. So, uh, I mean, I, Andrea became a patient of ours prior to uh, me knowing them that they had gone through that. I think at the time, and this is like 2006 and seven. It didn't really help that much. Not it didn't help that much not, with the removal. No. So you didn't see a decrease in the saliva and the drooling? Maybe a little bit, okay. but not enough for her to be going through all of that. Okay. So remember, the, con the, condition surgery, doesn't, uh, the condition doesn't cause excessive salivary flow. It's because they can't handle the secretions. Right. And that was the only reason why she had so much drooling and inability to close her lips to hold the drool it was the real problem. 
So by taking the gland out, was, the thought was, well, you'll minimize the saliva. Well, you have saliva flowing from other places. Right. You've got the parotid gland, you've got submandibular glands, you've got little minor salivary glands. So the two, the submandibular gland removal, I don't think really, really it helped really, her. She even went through the Botox. And that didn't help. It didn't work. So we just, we don't do them anymore because, well, obviously not now, but I mean back then. We just stopped because it wasn't doing anything. She was still doing... And this was collaborative, so our ENT colleagues were recommending that as a somewhat of a solution for the drooling. Right. So the real true functional improvement that you saw with, like, the saliva management and the closing of the mouth and the swallowing, can you speak to, like, what was her swallow prior to this surgery or what was her intake? I know you said she just drank a whole big she thing of water. Constantly had, we are constantly suctioning it out. Okay. Whatever goes in... You have to, it would come out. Um, she just drank, I was just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it was really hot out, and she's like, Mom, I'm just thirsty, I'm thirsty. She actually drank a whole, a big thing of water, and we wasn't suctioning it out. So she was actually drinking, which and she's swallowing. never done. She, yeah, she was swallowing it. So I guess my thing is, like, if you have to wait so, I'm sorry, I keep talking. I guess if you have to wait so long to actually have these surgeries, because you have to wait for the development to kind of be complete, there really is nothing out there. Like I always think about like external supports, like anything that would help approximate the mouth so you wouldn't get such significant changes. So, so there are, um, you know, so we call them, for lack of a better word, these jaw bras or chin cups yeah. um, that are out there. That, I mean, you can try that. Um, I, I just don't, I don't have a lot of experience long term to see from four years of age to now, to 20 or 18, how much effect that has, to be honest. Okay. But I don't, I don't see, you could try it. Right. And it won't harm the patient. Right. Okay. I think, okay. Thank you. From a respiratory standpoint, we're also placing pressure externally on the maxilla with most of our BiPAP interfaces. We're trying to get better with those devices so they sit more under the nose or in the nose so they don't press so much on the maxilla. But it, uh, it's a lot of stuff to have on your face. Uh, and, um, you know, the world I live in is breathing is primal, right? That, that's the one thing you have to do. And we honestly, we do forego facial development and that's a problem. And I think we can be better at, at recognizing that. Uh, I, I question uh, you know, what I can do or what someone else can augment for us when there's uh, a baby or a young child who needs BiPAP and we know either the palate is already deep and narrow or it will become that way. Can we do a palate expander prophylactically? Not an expander, just a you know, a counter pressure to, to the BiPAP. Right, and that's where our, our craniofacial orthodontists, uh, and they're, like we have the, the only accredited fellowship in Cleveland, there are craniofacial orthodontic centers that have specialized orthodontists that take care of these type of palate issues, that early intervention, and what we call interceptive ortho, is important in that discussion. So like we talked about the team approach, having your child go through a team assessment, evaluation and for collaborative and you know, interprofessional care is key. Can I be on that team? I'm only mentioning this because we're in process and we, spent, we started going to see an orthodontist at age five and we were doing a whole history of like the expanders and there was actually a um, orthodontic device that he put some brackets on the side and she would wear it with rubber bands and it pulled forward and it helped so much, it moved it like significantly forward, but then he said we need to stop because the plates had grown together. And I said, no, 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 we don't wanna stop. And he's like, we're stopping, it's done. You know, I'm the doctor, we're done. So there are things on, before the surgery, I would say go see an orthodontist, you know, definitely by the time they're five. And, but now we're in like a two year waiting. Now it's hard because he's like, yeah, I've done, the orthodontist has done everything. You gotta wait for the surgeon. And related to that, um, I, I was going to just first of all thank the team for sharing this information. The transformation is absolutely amazing. I've known Andrea for a very long time. Wonderful young lady, and I am so happy for her that she was able to have this surgery done. And it is successful beyond imagination. So congratulations to all of you. Um, and I also just wanted to um, jump in based on the discussion that's going on right now. So my daughter... Um, originally got involved with a cranial facial team when she was about three. Um, and, and we did interventions starting very early to guide the growth of her jaw starting back then. And what we were able to do by guiding the growth is avoid surgery. So she's now 21 
and her jaw is beautiful, awesome. You know, she, she's been able to, you know, chew, eat, swallow, do all of those things that I don't think would have been possible had we just let nature take its course. So if anyone wants to talk to me about what we did, I'm happy to share with you, um, you know, our team approach and everything that we were able to accomplish. And of course you can meet her. She is rolling around at the conference. Um, I think she's taking a nap right now, but she's here so you can all have a chance to meet her as well. Hi, this is Sheila from Hong Kong. We flew all the way to Chicago. Wow. Um, my question is, do mild, mild to moderate cases benefit from this surgery as well, or do you think it's too much for them to do it because it is a big procedure for them? No, so um, even in the mild cases, so I'll, I'll compare that to the average patient that doesn't have any problems and has underbite or overbite. These surgeries I can do within two, two and a half hours, upper and lower jaw repositioning, very quick. And so the recovery is extremely quick with a short surgery and they benefit. So the, the benefit of doing the procedure, would have, I'd have to see, you know, these mild cases, how mild they are or, you know, is there a small open bite? You know, so those kinds of things, everyone could, you know, we all have, a, uh, you know, underbite or overbite. It doesn't mean you need surgery. Right. So it all depends on, this, uh, on, on the, the, you know, x-rays and, and measurements and how bad the problem is that they can benefit from it. Right, That's so uh, after the surgery, because um, with the metal implants, so, because they, they always use, you know, very high pressure BiPAP at night or like a cough assist during the day, and that pressure will push the, the, the jaw back, backwards a little bit. But with this surgery, that won't happen again. I mean, the, the upper bit won't collapse. So there will, there will be a period of time where we would consult with the pulmonologist, whoever's managing the respiratory condition, you know, maybe we have to reduce the pressure for the first four weeks until bone heals. So bone healing does take four to, you know, four to eight weeks for bone healing to be complete. Even with the bone plates and screws, in the early post-operative period, it's very critical that we may have to adjust that pressure so it's not as, uh, as strong as it is. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a delicate balance between the two, uh, the two specialties. Um, but, yeah, once the bone heals, it's not going to move again. Uh, sorry, one last question. So after the surgery, um, do, will their um, te uh, biting strength um, improve a lot so that they can say like before, so I said at the moment my son couldn't, I mean he, he could probably have like 20 bites a meal and after that, that will improve, right? So that's, a, that's an unknown question. It all depends on individual patient and their skeletal muscle condition. And maybe, maybe you can maybe answer that post-operatively. We, we have no way to guesstimate how strong the bite force is going to be after the surgery. You know, my job really is just to get the bones aligned. So if they do have some muscle function, maybe we can go through some physical therapy and training. Yeah, I think, you know, that's still an open question, really, because, you know, we are coming up with ways, we think, to improve muscle force. And so one of the things we think is important is to make sure everything is aligned, everything is movable, because then as we get these mechanisms in place where you can increase function, that you can actually do it. So I think, you know, I don't want to limit, you know, what we're doing because of the current muscle uh, function, because I do think for many of these disorders that it is going to evolve over time. Right. Um, Thank you very much. Just, um, is, there, is, is it possible to make appointment? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, I had, I have a two-year-old son, two-and-a-half-year-old son, and I had spoken with a mom who has two sons with Lama 2, and she was going through all the things that they've gone through, and she had said, told me about the high-arched palate and how her son chose it doesn't want to have or does want to have the surgery. And then when I brought it up to his doctor, who was their same doctor, um, he was said it was more of a, like, if you want to, it's more cosmetic. It's, and I'm wondering if it's more for functionality or if it's more for cosmetic or if it's, if it's, it benefits them more greatly, if it's like more of a choice or do you suggest that we should, think about it more seriously so again at the young age you may not even well, see the yeah. changes right like so later. we have to wait till he starts to he or she starts to develop yeah 
And then as, as, as they're growing, you'll start to see the, the changes in the jaw. Yeah. And again, if, if it's this severe, this is not cosmetic surgery. This is well, yeah. functional surgery. But you're going to get a cosmetic benefit because the bones are in the right spot. Yeah. So they're going to look better. Well, he just made it sound like, oh, it's a choice. Maybe you want to. Maybe you don't. Like in the future, because I, I wasn't sure about any, any timelines. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it definitely is a choice, right? It's definitely yeah. a choice for every parent, family, patient. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. and the most... Yeah. The motivation, the motivation to do it would, would be based on what what, what the what want. the risks are and what yeah. the benefits are. Yeah. And well, then, I just wasn't sure. I don't. I I'm trying to see what what the options for the future are, even though it's a little further ahead. And then. Keep an open mind. Yeah. It also can really help with speech and eating, and so those are very very important functions to consider. That's at least what our doctor told us as well. Yeah, I was going to ask Andrea about that because I was curious whether or not this did change your ability to communicate in any way, either in voice or in, in um, mouthing words or uh, different things. Do you, is, the, is the sound that you can make the same? Uh -huh. um, it makes more, you can understand her more right. than she used to. I mean, only I was able to understand a lot of the right. words, but now other people can understand what she's saying. No, because I think that comes to the functional side of things as well, is that it can change voice as well as speech. And, and, and as you know, that we know, so, so we learn to speak early in our lives, right? One year of age, you know, making sounds and so forth. Um, and as the jaw grows, and if the jaw worsens, it's going to be very hard for that patient to to keep up with that. So maybe that, that may be a reason to intervene sooner than later. If it gets that bad, we, we, we can't develop those, those sounds. Yeah, absolutely. Knowing that there may be another operation later on, right? So that's the that's There's the a challenge. lot of letters that she c couldn't do before that she can do now because she can actually take her tongue and put up to her roof of her mouth, which she has never done before. So like a lot of the letters like L or whatever, you know, she can do now that she couldn't do before. Yeah. Hi. Um, my daughter is six years old, Nimli Mapthi, uh, NEB. Um, she's been using a BiPAP since she was two, but she's a mouth breather. So we didn't really have a choice. We ended up having to go with a full face mask. And that, there's no pressure on the upper jaw, right? But the pressure is more on the lower jaw. The, the mask sits beneath her chin. So the pressure is more, you know, on the, I guess the mandible, but further back. Um, and now she's at an age where we could probably go back to the nasal if we wanted to. Um, it seems like we're accomplishing the same type of pressures with the full face mask as we would with the nasal. But from, from your perspective, and she does see a maxillofacial specialist, she's already had the herpes brace and, and things. Um, is there a preference in where that pressure should be if somebody has an option to do a full face versus, I mean, is it better to have the pressure up here or down here when it comes to repairing in the future? Okay, so from a, from a breathing standpoint, uh, in, especially in small children, I prefer not to use a full face mask. I, I want their mouth available in case they have to vomit, uh, number one, right? Just protecting their airway, right? So using a full face mask comes with its own set of risks. Uh, two, it, even if the child can reach up and take the mask off uh, in case of nausea or vomiting, uh, it also pushes on the chin and retrudes it, and that can obstruct the airway even more. So you may actually have worsened breathing with a full face mask and reducing the leak or how much air escapes instead of going into the lungs. So I really worry about, uh, about mandibular pressure. I've seen plenty of kids who end up getting chin tucked and then it pushes it into the airway and they can't take a breath. Uh, and so and as soon as we relieve that, we go to just a nasal mask, their chin can come back out and not obstruct the airway. So from a breathing perspective, full face mask is, you have to do it really cautiously and I'd rather use a cervical collar to bring the chin up and close the mouth. Uh, okay. Thank you. Just to follow up, um, what, are, what are your thoughts on like a chin strap? Because that's been recommended. My son also mouth breathes uh, while using BiPAP. And then what is your opinion on like um, 
the BiPAP pushing pressure like on their tongue, like pushing the tongue forward. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't mind chin straps. They don't have to be particularly tight. The, nowadays, the ventilators overcome leaks very well. They just generate more airflow to, to compensate, essentially, for, for leak. And so even someone who sleeps with an open mouth position can generally be ventilated pretty well to a certain extent. Uh, so chin strap or cervical collar, anything to push up gently. But again, it's then, then you're creating the same issue as a full face mask, right? If you have to vomit, you can't open your mouth and let it out. So some chin movement is absolutely necessary. Yeah. And the other question? Uh, the tongue, whether you see the BiPAP pushing tongue forward. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen BiPAP worsening airway obstruction. Uh, so I, I don't mind it. You may see an increase in drooling at night because it's actually pushing out, um, but I don't worry about it causing aspiration either because uh, it's going to push things aside, and then the mucous membranes can help absorb extra fluid. I was kind of more like the tongue thrusting perspective. Yeah, yeah I, um, if we get the tongue out of the way and we can ventilate better, everyone feels better. It's my, so it, it, it is trading one problem for another perhaps. Hi, um, my son is 10 and about six months ago I mentioned to his neurologist that his jaw is not looking symmetrical anymore. If you look in one part of his mouth it looks like someone's actually got their finger and started pushing in his lower jaw. He's also got molars that look like they're growing out of the centre top of his, of his mouth. So he, he has nemaline myopathy, he has a high arch palate. We always knew this was coming. Um, so he's 10. So, um, so the neurologist uh, referred us to paediatric dentistry. Paediatric dentistry, dentistry is like, that's not our gig. Let's refer you to... Um, thank you. <laughs> so, I, so, and I haven't heard anything from anybody. So, um, so big part of the reason why I came to this lecture today was to try and understand where does paediatric dentistry stop? Where do you guys start? Do you have to work together? Is this something that I should be worrying about right now? Is, uh, I have no idea at this point. So. Right, so again, um, even if you send, get sent to a maxillofacial surgeon, hopefully they're connected with the, an orthodontic group. Orthodontics is key in this whole, whole process of assessment. And then, it, like I said, it's a team assessment and collaboration of when things should happen and start. Pediatric dentistry is great because they, just like pediatric uh, pediatricians, or gatekeepers, they see you first, they see them more often, and then they can channel you. They may not have the expertise to take care of the patient, but then they'll, they'll send you over to the specialist. Orthodontics is the one specialist, then you'll see the maxillofacial surgeon. And then between the two of them, we'll collaborate on, on timing, on when things should happen. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll just be like expander type stuff first. So all, you know, non-invasive care. Interceptive, whoever we mentioned earlier on, that get them to the orthodontist first because, the, and the orthodontist needs to be capable. So there's some great orthodontists that are in the community, but may not be capable of taking care of craniofacial and complex occlusion problems or bite problems. So that, that's gonna be where it's sometimes challenging if you're in a small, smaller area and not in a big city center. That the orthodontist may not be comfortable with the complexity of the condition. Okay. Well, so. we're going through the University of Michigan, so oh, yeah, I know, I know them in Ann, Ar Ann Arbor, right? Yeah, that's I know them very well. Correct. So, should I be going straight to the maxilliofacial guys first, or should I be going? Shouldn't we be seeing an orthodontist first? Yeah. So, if 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 the, if you go to one person, then they can get you plugged into a team. Right. And then okay. the team will then initiate, you know, have you come in for a day where you'll see everybody in one shot. Right. Got it. Okay. So even if you, used to, even if you enter one, one avenue of the team, then, then they'll, they'll funnel you into the team meeting. Thank you. And the teams are different at different institutions. So that you, sometimes you'll have a cleft palate team that's distinct from a velopharyngeal team. So you really have to find out what, you know, what that institution is doing. 
And speaking of good teams, I think we're up on time. They're opening up the door soon, but I want to thank this awesome A team for their performance today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.